Welcome back, dear friends, to the Crimson Academy's Exploring the Advent of Divine Justice. We are continuing on part 19, covering paragraphs 81 through 86. And before we start, we will have our opening prayer. Thank you. Praise be unto thee, O Mark God, that thou hast sent down unto us that which draws us nigh unto thee and supply us with every good thing sent down by thee in thy books and thy scriptures. Protect us, we beseech thee, O my Lord, from the hosts of idle fancies and vain imaginings. Thou in truth art the mighty, the all-knowing. I testify, O my God, to that wherewith unto thy chosen ones have testified and acknowledge that which the inmates of the all-highest paradise and those who have circled round thy mighty throne have acknowledged. The kingdoms of earth and heaven are thine, O Lord of the worlds. Baha'u'llah. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, dear friends, so good to see everyone. And after two weeks, missed everyone, and we're going to now get back into it. Okay, so let me share my screen so you can all see what I'm going to be seeing. Here we go. Make sure this is the right one. Yeah, cool. So Part 19, dear friends, we were covering uh, paragraphs 81 through 86. And in our last session, we covered enhancing community diversity. Everyone rec recall this? So the aspect of focusing on teaching African-Americans as well as teaching uh, Native Americans. So this was the focus of... Um, our part, the opening part of paragraphs 81. Now we're going to get into really part paragraph 82. So let us get into that and start our study. Okay. So this is the beloved guardian speaking in paragraph 82. And he's now outlining three stages of the teaching campaign. Okay, so three stages of the teaching campaign. The beloved guardian paragraph 82 emphasizes the need to strengthen and support Baha'i groups formed in North America to evolve into fully functioning assemblies. The beloved guardian, he then identifies these three stages that every single teaching campaign of the first seven year plan should pass through. So what are these three phases? First, sufficient pioneers arise to make the necessary sacrifices to bring these teaching projects to fruition. Second, the Baha'i administrative order is implanted in the heart of the Virgin territories. And third, the Baha'i institutions are secured in the hearts and minds of the inhabitants of those territories. So first stage, they arise to make the necessary sacrifices to bring those teaching projects to fruition. Once that certain number of uh, pioneers have arisen, next will be the implantation of the Baha'i administrative order. Once the Baha'i administrative order has taken root, the Baha'i institutions are secured in the hearts and minds of the inhabitants and territories. This is stage after stage after stage. These endeavors are challenging and burdensome, but His Holiness Baha'u'llah has promised his assistance and confirmation when one arises to serve. We see this constantly throughout the writings. In fact, I've seen more um, addresses of 
when one arises to serve, the confirmations come. If you look, just look in regards to the aspect of teaching, you see how many times either Baha'u'llah, His Holiness Abdul Baha, the beloved guardian, constantly talk about confirmations, confirmations. It's almost like we got your back. You know, you go teach, we got your back. The concourse and high is ready to come to your assistance. So the beloved guardian then cites some statements from Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha in paragraphs 82 and 83 on this assurance of assistance vouchsafed for those who sacrificially support the cause of God. Such strategies have been reiterated by the beloved guardian, Shor Effendi, in other messages to the North American Baha'i community. The goals of the first seven-year plan were won by the community closely following the guidance of the beloved guardian. And this is an extract from His Holiness Baha'u'llah on the right. It says, should any man in this day arise and with absolute detachment from all that is in the heavens and all that is on the earth, set his affections on him who is the day spring of God's holy revelation. He will verily be empowered to subdue all created things, though the potency of one of the names of the Lord his God, the all-knowing, the all-wise. Baha'u'llah. So if you go and arise, but what you have to arise with? Absolute detachment from all that is in the heavens on the earth. And then you have to set your, your focus. You have to set your affections on him. What will happen? If you set your affections on him, he will be empowered to subdue all created things. The power will be infused into you. See? This is, it's almost like a formula that Baha'u'llah is presenting. He says, if you do this, if you do this, and if you do this, then, then I will release the powers. I will release the confirmations. I will, you know, um, bring the concourse on high to you. So it is um, almost an, um, in that sense, um, a formula of how to gain the assistance from the concourse and high. So there we go. Let us get into this paragraph. This is from the beloved guardian and it's in the uh, writings uh, from the beloved guardian in th the document, this decisive hour. So let us have our first reader. I see my friend Dennis McGregor here. Go for it, Dennis. Good to see you. Good evening, everybody. Okay. In a mess teaching campaign, in a message dated 13th April 1944, written to the American Baha'i community at the end of the first seven year plan, Shulgi Effendi illustrated the immensity of the victories achieved. The one remaining, and indeed the most challenging task confronting the American Baha'i community has at long last been brilliantly accomplished. The structural basis of the administrative order of the faith of Baha'u'llah has, through this superb victory, and on the very eve of the worldwide celebrations of the centenary of his faith, been firmly laid by the champion builders of his world order in every state of the great Republic of the West, and in, in every province of the Dominion of Canada. In each of the republics of Central and South America, moreover, the banner of his inde undefeatable faith has been implanted by the members of that same community. While in no less than 13 republics of Latin America, as well as in two dependencies in the West Indies, spiritual assemblies have been established and are already functioning, a feat that has outstripped the goal originally fixed for the valiant members of that community in their intercontinental sphere of Baha'i activity. Excellently read. Thank you very much, Dennis. So this uh, was the goal of the first seven-year plan, to go forth and lay a uh, pioneer to all these provinces 
in Central America and South America. And so they went forth and they achieved these goals. And they even went to no less than 13 republics of Latin America, as well as two dependencies in the West Indies. So spiritual assemblies have been established. This was the goal of the first seven-year plan. So this was an incredible achievement. So let us get into it. In paragraph 84, the beloved guardian explains the aim and direction of this second phase of the teaching campaign that was initiated to achieve the expansion goals of the seven-year plan. After establishing a nucleus of the Baha'i administration in every virgin state and province of the North American continent, energy should be focused on awaking of the nations of Latin America to the call of Baha'u'llah. You see, they achieved it. I, I gave you the answer ahead of time, as they say. They did it. But this is what, in paragraph 84, the beloved guardian is saying, go forth and do it. Now you've achieved the goal of um, establishing um, assemblies in every one of the states and in the provinces of Canada. But now your goal is to go forth to Latin America. This is what the beloved guardian is calling them to go forth to. Awaking the nations of Latin America to the call of Baha'u'llah. And in paragraph 85 and 86, the beloved guardian provides more on this significance and impact of achieving this uh, specific and the second phase of the plan. The 20 independent nations of Central and South America are destined to play an important role in the world's future destiny. Communication advances in the future will overcome the difficulties caused by the distances separating them at the time from the North American continent. The beloved guardian, Shor Effendi, specifically states that in paragraph 86, that teaching activity should be followed by an offensive to conquer the forces of darkness, corruption, and ignorance. That's very interesting, I, th I found, that not only are you teaching the faith, from, you know, but then you should have a campaign to conquer the forces of darkness, which is corruption and ignorance. Isn't that interesting? Do we have campaigns to conquer these forces of darkness within our communities? You know, even after the teaching, even when we're Baha'is, you know, do we have campaigns to conquer these forces within our communities? These are, this is something that the beloved guardian is saying we should focus on. And here, this is from the beloved guardian. He says, the world is full of evil and dark forces, and the friends must not permit these forces to get hold of them by thinking and feeling negatively towards each other. Isn't that interesting? The world is full of evil and dark forces, full of it. And the friends must not permit these forces to get hold of them by thinking and feeling negatively towards each other. I remember uh, there's this wonderful um, uh, proverb that says a boat will never sink unless the water comes in. But as long as the water is outside of the boat, the boat will never sink. But if you let the negative forces get into the, into the boat, then the boat has the potential of sinking. So you don't let, you be on guard. You be on guard to not let these evil and dark forces come into your heart. Excellent. Now, remember, we're talking about all of these Latin American countries, the goal, the, the goal of the second phase of the seven-year plan. And so the, let's go explore the first one. Mexico, our, our uh, community to the south. So in the Tablets of the Divine Plan, His Holiness Abdul Baha identifies specific goals in Central and Southern America for the American Baha'is to achieve. 
he states the Republic of Mexico is very important. The majority of the inhabitants of that country are devoted Catholics. They are totally unaware of the reality of the Bible, the gospel, and the new divine teachings. They do not know that the basis of the religions of God is one and that the holy manifestations are like unto the son of truth rising from the different dawning places. Those souls are submerged in the sea of dogmas. If one breath of life be blown over them, great results will issue therefrom. But it is better for those who intend to go to Mexico to teach to be familiar with the Spanish language. So there's the instruction. If you plan to go to Mexico, you should be familiar with the Spanish language. And this is an instruction that comes up again, where it says, if you're planning to go to any country, you need to know the language that you plan to go to. And similarly, the six Central American republics situated south of Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, and the seventh country, Belize, or the British Honduras. The teachers going to those parts must also be familiar with the Spanish language. And this is from Abdul Baha'u'llah and Tablets of the Divine Plan. And all the above countries have importance, but which one is especially important? But especially the Republic of Panama, wherein the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans come together through the Panama Canal. It is a center for travel and passage from America to other continents of the world. And in the future, it will gain most great importance. This will, uh, we already have um, a house of worship in Panama and that country, Panama, will we, in the future, we will see how incredibly important that country will be. It's, um, it's, we're still too close to, the, to the, be, the beginnings of this faith. And we obviously know that it connects the two, um, the northern and the southern parts of this continent, but um, it is, and it connects two oceans but there's so much more in the sense of the spiritual importance of Panama. And obviously, because there's so many wonderful uh, countries um, that the beloved guardian is calling the believers to go out and pioneer, he's saying it's a time to learn Spanish. Because <laughs> this is, you know, even if we are reaching our elderly age, I it's good to uh, practice and try to learn another skill and learn to be able to speak Spanish. So that is something uh, that we should all try to work on. And in another one, let us have a reader. I, I, I love hearing your voices. So let us go to Miss Darla. Good to see you, Miss Darla. You're up. Second phase of the seven year plan. In a similar way, the republics of the continent of South America, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, British Guiana, Dutch Guiana, French Guiana, Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, Venezuela, also the islands to the north, east, and west of South America, such as the Falkland Islands, the Galapagos, Juan Fernandez, Tobago, and Trinidad. Likewise, the city of Bahia, situated on the eastern shore of Brazil, because it, it is some time that it has become known by this name, its efficacy will be most potent. Excellent. Thank you so much. Very well read. The name of this city, Bahia, as it's so close to the name of Baha. It's, this is what uh, Abdul Baha said. Is in, he said, likewise, the city of Bahia, situated on the eastern shore of Brazil, it is some time that has been, become known, but its efficacy will be most potent, that there is some incredible spiritual importance even in that it was called Bahia. 
So I will share some of these uh, wonderful pictures um, of the friends going off and pioneering to these spots around um, these uh, Latin American countries. So here we have Hands of the Cause of God, Ramatula Mahajar, Paul Haney, and Enoch Olinga. And they are in that city, Bahia, Brazil, January 1977. Isn't that awesome? So cool. And here we have the convention guests and the newly elected National Assembly. So this is April 29th, 1939. So this is the convention guests and newly elected National Assembly. And so this is, uh, we have Mr. Pedro Espinosa, Mrs. Refugio Ocho, Ms. Nene, Da Jurado and Mrs. Maria Luisa Jurado of Mexico City. And there's Mr. and Mrs. Sabet of Tehran and Mrs. E.R. Matthews, the chairman. So this is the Inter-America Committee. Do you recall we talked about the Inter-America Committee? So this is the Inter-America Committee meeting with the National Spiritual Assembly in 1939. So cool. So they were planning the affairs to go forth and pioneer. And you can see how uh, the house of worship is under construction behind them. And right in the center, you can see, who is that? Right here. Can any, does anyone know who this is? African-American. Member of the National Spiritual Assembly. Is it Horace Holly? It's Horace Holly. It, Horace Holly is this white gentleman right here. I'm talking about this gentleman right here. Is that Lewis Gregory? That is Lewis Gregory. That's correct. Gregory. Good. Yes. Two points, Dennis. So, yep, that's that's Lewis Gregory, and. Um, there is uh, an incredible, incredible um, book by Elsie Austin. And uh, she wrote such an, a loving, loving, loving tribute to Lewis Gregory. And um, I'll share that to the class. I also uh, recorded it because it's something uh, to know his story. You know, it's so important because it's so inspiring, uh, Lewis Gregory, as a champion of racial justice. It's um, to understand the sacrifices, to understand of how much he went through going through the South of all places as an African-American man to go and teach. And especially when the, the obedience to go and marry a white woman, even though he loved her, sure. But to, to, um, to marry her out of the obedience and love of Abdul Baha, when a time was, you cannot marry in, in America because of the instructions. But he did it out of love and obedience. And it's um, an incredible individual, uh, Lewis Gregory. So I just touched on him because. Uh, okay, Mason, I have some question for you. Please, dear Tesfai, go for it. Yeah, because something that I don't understand about, uh, maybe it's my first time, the, what is this uh, British and uh, Dutch Go Guyana or Guyana, where is they located? Did they say South America? Yes, yes, yes. I have yes. never heard this before, where they are. Yes, they were um, colonies. This is part of the colonization of um, oh. when the these uh, the imperials went and trying to conquer this uh, southern and central Americas to for really was for enslavement. They were establishing colonies, and oh. yeah, so they set up the Guyanas. One was British, and one was Eastern and Western, and they were under. I think even the names have changed. Uh, I think it's just called Guyana or. Um, yeah, I never heard before. That's why I'm asking you because I don't know. Maybe I'm behind. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right because now I, there's no longer called British Guyana or Eastern or Western. It's just called Guyana. So this is the all a lot of these countries in southern Central Americas 
including obviously the United States, have have the the blood of slavery over them and the the history of colonization. And in uh, so this is a reality that how even they were set up, the names even were because they were colonies under. Uh, so that is, uh, dear testified, that's how they came to be. Thank you. Anyhow, excellent. thank you. Thank you much. All right. So here's another really cool picture. So this is the 31st annual convention. So this is the Baha'is of the United States and Canada. You remember, because you remember this uh, letter was written 1938, right? December 25th, 1938. So there was the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States and Canada. So this is uh, the convention after. So this is April uh, 27, 28, 29, 30, 1939. So right after this letter, the call for the sec uh, to go forth and achieve the goals of the second uh, part of the first seven-year plan, the goals to go forth and go out, this was the convention where it happened. And so this, all these wonderful souls and friends were hearing um, the call of the beloved guardian to go forth and go pioneer. So this is. So although there was no systematic campaign to realize the vision of Abdul Baha in Central and South America for 20 years, some individuals arose to travel teach and pioneer to Latin America as soon as they learned about the wishes of Abdul Baha. Among them was the indomitable Martha Root, who visited the important cities of South America in 1919 and established valuable contacts. However, with the launch of the first seven-year plan, the Guardian called for more permanent pioneers to settle in all the countries of Latin America. The National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States and Canada appointed this Inter-America Committee to coordinate and drive those goals. And the first contingent of pioneers left North America for different parts of Central and South America in 1939. And here on the right, this is the new plans for pioneer teaching. And this comes from July 1939, this comes from the Baha'i News. This is straight from it. And it says, the latest developments in pioneer teaching and settlement in areas which require assistance. Mr. Gerard Sluter in proceeding to Guatemala and Mr. Anto Anto and Antorno Roca to Honduras. Mrs. Stewart is extending her stay in Buenos Aires which the Guardian desired. And Mr. Philip Marangala has gone to Cuba. And Miss, Miss Nyan Hartfield is to establish herself in St. Louis, Missouri. And Miss Nan Reasoner will work among the Blackfoot Indians near Calgary, Alberta. And Miss Honor Kempton has transferred her residence to Anchorage, Alaska from Juneau. And Mr. Matthew Kazab has settled in Panama and is now working under the supervision of the Inter-America Committee. Other important plans for teaching in Latin America and North America are in progress and further reports will be made from time to time. In the light of the Guardian's recent message, the historic importance of these valiant efforts is manifest. So they're going forth. They're actually settling. You know, this is what the beloved guardian is saying. Go settle in different areas and start the work of sowing the seeds and planting. So this is what they are doing. All right. And so several of these individuals are actually significant uh, individuals. Mr. Matthew Kazza, that was an incredible uh, teacher. Um, so. 
dear friends, when you in later on, you can always go look these individuals up. These are great uh, teachers. And obviously, obviously, Martha Root, you should know her life well and read up on her and be inspired by her life. And another one is Miss uh, Armstrong. Miss, Lee, uh, Miss Armstrong, she went uh, to South America. She's an incredible, incredible, um, dedicated um, teacher of the cause. So, oh, oh, so uh, obedient and sacrificial. Um, she look her up. Uh, there's an incredible story of her on YouTube. And it takes, I'll send that to the class so you can see uh, Miss Leonore. Armstrong, credible servant. Okay, let's move on, dear friends. We're doing very good today. Now, this is from the Inter-America Teaching. So it says, since the convention, several of the plans that were in the offing have become events and others have been ratified by the National Spiritual Assembly to be carried out in the coming months. Three subcommittees have been formed, Eastern States, Middle and Pacific Coast Area, respectively. These co-workers will discover contacts among the Pan-American societies, which are reaching out to our Southern neighbors and fostering goodwill or material reciprocity. In August, Ms. Eva Nicklin, cooperating with the administrative order, will settle in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, as a permanent resident. And Mr. Philip Marangello is leaving for Havana and for at least one year will advance the New World Order in Cuba. And Mr. Gerard Sluter, now of Toronto, has left for Guatemala. In Mexico City, Mr. Pedro Espinosa and the friends are working on the translations into Spanish of Some Answer Questions, Foundations of World Unity, Wisdom of Abdul Baha, Baha'i Procedure, the Booklet of Prayers, and maybe bought from the Publishing Society or from the assembly in Mexico. And other representative to Panama, Mr. Matthew Kazab, is gaining newspaper publicity of excellent type and is giving a series of lectures in the School of Arts and Trades. And we are watching the post for the next page of his refreshing tropical news published nine degrees north of the equator. So this is shortly after, right, dear friends? September, 1939. So less than a year after the beloved guardian has called them forth from this message, the advent of divine justice, the call to go forth as this aspect of the go win the goals of the second part of the first seven year plan. They're already going forth. You can see they're already settling uh, in different areas for different countries and uh, winning achievements. So this is the aspect of immediate obedience and love. And that these, uh, they've already formed an inter-America teaching committee. They've already uh, established subcommittees and are working to open the countries in Latin America and South America. So you see, this is less than one year after the beloved guardian has said, go do it. And they're already doing it. That's called obedience. Isn't that awesome? I love it. So here we go. Now, this is just a, a few months after the last letter, November 1939. So Luis Caswell sailed for Panama from South San Francisco on September 25th on the SS city of Norfolk. John Eichenhauser Jr. embarked at Los Angeles bound for San Salvador by the same steamer. Antonio Roca left by motor for Honduras via Mexico. Mrs. Cora Oliver sailed from New York, September 29th, bound for Panama City. The National Spiritual Assembly has ratified the appointment of Mrs. Gail Wilson and Mrs. Ford for Costa Rica in October. Mrs. Norse has arrived in Montevideo for a three month stay with her son and Mr. Wilfred Barton is there also living at present with the leader of our study group. Senior Simone Rosenzweig, in Santos, Mr. Barton spent an evening with her friends from Washington and Mr. And Mrs. Worley on his way to the Argentine here. He also found Miss Holsapel had come down from Bahia to greet the Worleys. Our teacher, fresh from Latin America, Mrs. Francis Benedict Stewart, has been asked to go to Washington 
and confer with the State Department. Also, she has had the opportunity to taking the pulpit Sunday night in Presbyterian Church. The ministers, rabbis of Utica all know that Mrs. Stewart is a Baha'i and all ask her help in their work without any objections. See this, dear friends? One after another. One after another. This is literally, this, the last one was September. Now this is November 1939. 19, December 1938, this letter came out, December 25th. This is still 11 months after Advent of Divine Justice came out. And you can see the power of the, of the pioneers going forth, the obedience and the love of the energy released from that national convention where I showed you the picture that they just went, they did it. Isn't that awesome? I, it's incredible to me, at least, you know, to see the, how they're going forth. So here we go. Here's some, uh, some more, because this is the first Latin America Baha'i session dedicated to the Baha'i inter-America activity. And this is at Temerity Ranch, Pine Valley, Colorado Springs, Colorado. And this was June 12th through the 24th of 1940. And this is in Pine Valley, Colorado. This was a Baha'i school called Temerity Ranch. And I was curious, what happened to this Temerity Ranch? And I looked and I actually sent a message to our dear National Spiritual Assembly because it was in the same vein as Bosch Baha'i School, Lou Helen, Green Acre. Temerity Ranch. It was gifted uh, to our National Spiritual Assembly. So I was curious what happened to it. And apparently, the military wanted to build a base. <laughs> and so they needed the grounds. And so they acquired the land and um, the, the monies went to the National Spiritual Assembly. So that is what happened to the Temerity Ranch. But it was a, a Baha'i school and it was used for the purpose of training the friends to go forth, to, uh, to go forth to the countries. And so it was a, a, a specific school, Temerity Ranch was designed uh, for, um, as a training uh, launching platform to go forth in the pioneering goals, to win the pioneering goals. Okay. Um, let us, oh, we're almost finished with this section. Very, it's uh, very exciting. In the message dated 13th April 1944 to the American Baha'is at the end of the first seven year plan, the beloved guardian spoke of the victories in Latin America in each of the republics of Central and South America. Moreover, the banner of his undefeatable faith has been implanted by the members of that same community while in no less than 13 republics of Latin America, as well as in two dependencies in the West Indies, spiritual assemblies have been established and are already functioning. A feat that has outstripped the goal originally fixed for the valiant members of that community in their intercontinental sphere of Baha'i activity. So do you recall we read this extract before because I wanted to give you a snapshot earlier and then take you through it. So now this is the beloved guardian speaking. You have won the goals, an incredible feat. And on the right, you see the first Baha'i community of Latin America. This is Mexico City, 1938. Isn't that awesome to see the first local spiritual assembly of Mexico? And this is the first spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of San Jose, Costa Rica, 1941. So they went forth and they started assemblies, just like the beloved guardian went and told them to. 1941. And here's the first spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Tegucigalpa, Honduras, 1942. So they went forth. And you can see some of them are uh, indigenous uh, inhabitants. So they went forth and lovingly embraced the inhabitants of their com the communities. And you can see some of them are indigenous in these areas. First spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Port-au-Prince, Haiti. So lovely to see the friends. 
can see African Americans here and from Haitians, local inhabitants, 1942. First spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Bogota, Colombia, 1944 with Dorothy Baker, right here, Dorothy pa Baker, representing the Inter-America Committee. You see that? So there are, um, these, uh, this is in the first assembly of the Baha'is of Bogota. And here's the first local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of, I don't know how to pronounce this one, um, Quayaquil, Ecuador. Photographed of the members of the spiritual. Miss Valerie, God bless you. Go for it. One more time. Guayaquil. Sounds good to me, Miss Valerie. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Guayaquil. <laughs> good job, Tesfaye. I'll, I'll, I'll accept your pronunciation, but I'm not going to venture <laughs> on that one. <laughs> you know what I see is more is ladies, man. It's nice. It's very interesting. You observe that. And we're going to yeah. see that coming up in part uh, 22. And the beloved guardian also made that keen observation. And he, in part 22, we're going to, to the beloved guardian addresses that the lady's receptivity, receptivity is keener yes. and their heart is ready. So you can see that on the early institutions, the, rep the representation is many times more women. Um, yeah. And that's an interesting observation, very good observation. And so also something unique about this dispensation is the championesses of this faith have been ladies, the ones that have gone out, the ones who have championed the flag and the banner have been ladies from Martha Root to uh, General Jack, to Marion Jack, to all of these great heroines have their ladies. Another, this is unique to this dispensation. And we're going to cover that in great detail. Of course, this is how Esson does it. You know, it was actually one line in Advent of Divine Justice. But I've made a whole part out of it because it's so important to, to highlight these great heroines in the Baha'i faith. And so I've uh, really um, expanded that as, and it's going to be in part 22 or 21. I think it's 21. Yeah, part 21. So that's coming up, dear friends. We look forward to it. Okay, moving on. First public meeting for the youth. Isn't that cool? The youth, look at these young chaps held under the auspices of the Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Punta Arenas, Magalines, Chile. This is July, 1945. Wow, July, 1945. So these are one of the first ever youth gatherings in South America. And this is uh, the first public meeting. And here's a first Baha'i Latin American conference. So now they're having their own conferences. What? This is only a few years after the guardians said go forth and open up these countries. And they're actually having their own conferences. Look at how many believers there are already here. And this is, so now they're having conferences. So this is the first Baha'i Latin American conference. Panama Baha'i representatives were present from the United States. Nicaragua, Chile, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Honduras, El Salvador, Venezuela, the Canal Zone, and Panama. Man, can you believe this? Just a few years after the Guardian said, go forth, not only have they opened up all the countries, they've already reached the capacity of having their own regional conferences. And there we are, dear friends. We conclude part 19. So that gives you a flavor of the intensity and scope of not only in, in part 19, we talked about the diversity, how we have to increase the diversity, really focus on the diversity. 
and the call is is even though the beloved guardian engaged and said 80 years ago we need to focus on the increasing the call of diversity in our community even just less than a month ago our dear national spiritual assembly in, a, in the document a call to action said this is the call today to to focus on diversity namely focusing on engaging and teaching our dear african american brothers and sisters and our native americans and this is our focus that we should work to increase the diversity as well as we also got to see this, the the how the bahais were so lovingly obedient to win the goals of the first, of the second part of the first seven year plan by going forth in pioneering so that was that was our part 19. So let me go, dear friends. Where are we with time? We're good. We're real good on time. So let us go to our next part. Everyone doing well? Yeah. Hey, son, can I uh, add something about Matthew Kazab? Oh, please. He ended up in Nicaragua and he was teaching the miners' children in the blue fields. And he got put in prison and and he was ill and they let him out and then he was going to the airplane and they put him back in prison but finally he was so sick they just wanted him to be out of the country so he came back to the united states and he died in brownsville texas and oh, his wow. grave his grave is there he died in the 1940s i don't have the dates in front of me but the Baha'is here in the Rio Grande Valley um, were in the process of uh, getting a, a new stone and some information about him there at the cemetery. He, he was buried in the Pauper Cemetery and he's surrounded mm. by children's graves. Excellent. Thank you, dear Valerie. Yeah, this is an incredible teacher. He, as you saw, he went forth immediately out of love and obedience. Thank you, dear Valerie, for sharing that um, anecdote. That was uh, interesting. So, dear friends, let us march on into part 20. So, I just got it pulled up, and I need to obviously share my screen with you guys. So, let me do that. There. All right. Okay. So here we go. Part 20, dear friends. This is one of my favorite sections of uh, this Advent of Divine Justice because it covers this energy girding up the loins of your endeavor. What an incredible phrase the beloved guardian uses here. Girding up the loins of your endeavor. And so this, in this section, we're covering paragraphs 87 through 94. And now, it's, this is about the erection of the framework of the administrative order. So this is now, we're going to build these institutions. What does it take to build uh, uh, this, the framework to, to have fully functioning administrative order? So let us get into... Um, these paragraphs. So we'll, first, we're going to have some readers, then we'll get into, um, as we always do, into studying and analyzing these paragraphs. So without any further ado, our first reader is Miss Mary McGregor. Go for it, Mary. Good to see you. Good to see you and everyone. Um, the Advent of Divine Justice Paragraphs Under Study. Paragraph 87. Let some at this very moment gird up the loins of their endeavor, flee their native towns, cities, and states, forsake their country, and putting their whole trust in God as the best provision for their journey, set their faces and direct their steps towards those distant climes, those virgin fields, those unsurrendered cities, 
and bend their energies to capture the citadels of men's hearts. Hearts which, as by how Allah has written, the host of revelation and of utterance can subdue. Let them not tarry until such time as their fellow laborers will have passed the first stage in their campaign of teaching, but let them rather from this very hour arise to usher in the chapters in the international history of their faith. Usher in the opening phase of what will come to be regarded as one of the most glorious chapters in the international history of their faith. Let them at the very onset teach their own selves that their speech may attract the hearts of their hearers. Let them regard the triumph of their faith as their supreme objective. Let them not consider the largeness or smallness of the receptacle that carries the measure of grace that God poured forth in this age. Let them disencumber themselves of all attachment to this world and the vanities thereof. And with that spirit of detachment which Abdu Baha exemplified and wished them to emulate, bring these diversified peoples and countries to the remembrance of God and his supreme manifestation. Beautifully read, Miss Mary. Thank you so much. Welcome. Let his love be a storehouse of treasure for their souls on the day when every pillar shall tremble, when the very skins of men shall creep, when all eyes shall stare up with terror. Let their souls be a glow with the flame of the undying fire that burneth in the midmost heart of the world, in such wise that the waters of the universe shall be powerless to cool down its ardor. Let them be unrestrained as the wind, which neither the sight of desolation nor the evidences of prosperity can either pain or please. Let them unloose their tongues and proclaim unceasingly his cause. Let them proclaim that which the most great spirit will inspire them to utter in the service of the cause of their Lord. Let them beware lest they contend with anyone, nay strive to make him aware of the truth with kindly manner and most convincing exhortation. Let them, wholly for the sake of God, proclaim his message and with that same spirit accept whatever response their words may evoke in their hearers. Let them not for one moment, forget that the faithful spirit shall strengthen them through its power and that a company of his chosen angels shall go forth with them as bidden by him who is the almighty, the all wise. Let them even bear in mind how great is the blessedness that awaiteth them that have attained the honor of serving the Almighty, and remember that such a service is indeed the prince of all goodly deeds and the ornament of every goodly act. All right. Let's see who we have. Major. Oh. Major, would, would you like to read? Dr. Sotibayat, are you there? Uh, she might have. 
Okay, test five, please read, go ahead. Test, go for it, there. Okay. Good, good. Paragraph 88. And finally, let these souls steering words of Baha'u'llah. As they pursue their, con their course throughout the lands and beneath of the Southern American continent, be ever ready on their lips, a solace of their hearts of light on their paths, a companion in their loneliness, and a daily sustenance in their journeys, O oh, wayfarer in the path of God, take thou thy portion of the ocean of his grace, and deprive not thyself of the things that lie hidden in the depths, and a dew drop out of the ocean wood is shed upon all that are in the heavens and on earth, suffice to enrich them with the bounty of God, the almighty, the all-knowing, the all-wise, with the hands of the renunciation, draw forth from its life-giving waters and sprinkle therewith all created things that they may be cleansed from all man-made limitations and may approach the mighty sea of God. This hallowed and resplendent spot, be not grieved if thou performs, if thou, if thyself alone, let God be all sufficient to thee. Proclaim the cause of thy Lord unto all who are in the heavens and on earth. Should any man respond to thy call, lay bare before him the pearls of the wisdom of the Lord, thy God, which his spirit has sent down upon thee, and be thou of them that truly believe. And should anyone reject thy offer, turn thou away from him and put thy trust and confidence in the Lord of all worlds by the righteousness of God, who so opens his lips in this day and makes mention of the name of his Lord, the hosts of divine inspiration shall descend upon him from the heaven of my name, the all-knowing, the all-wise. On him shall also descend the conquerors on high, each bearing aloft a chalice of pure light. Thus has it been foreordained in the realm of God's revelation by the behest of him who is the all-glorious the most powerful. Beautifully read your test. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So I have a question here is, so what is, what does it mean by geared up the loans of endeavor? That's why I say it's the first thing I think Yes, we're going to get to that, dear Tesfaya. Um, uh, it's a great question. What is girding up the loins? So that is a, we're going to get to that. And we're going to explore all in depth, all of these paragraphs. So let's get through them because we have a few of them to get through and then we're going to go and answer all the questions, okay? So Miss Marianne, could you read this one for us? You're muted, dear Miss Marianne. Thank you. Marianne, you need to unmute yourself first. There you go. 
Okay. Is this better? Much better. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Let these words of Abdul Baha, gleaned from the tablets of the divine plan, ring likewise in their ears as they go forth, assured and unafraid, on his mission. O ye apostles of Baha'u'llah, may my life be sacrificed for you. Behold the portals which Baha'u'llah has opened before you. Consider how exalted and lofty is the station you are destined to attain. How unique the favors with which you have been endowed. My thoughts are turned towards you and my heart leaps within me at your mention. Could ye know how my soul glows with your love? So great a happiness would flow your heart as to cause you to become enamored with each other. The full measure of your success is as yet unrevealed, its significance still unapprehended. Ere long you will, with your own eyes, witness how brilliantly every one of you, even as a shining star, will radiate in the firmament of your country the light of divine guidance and will bestow upon its people the glory of an everlasting life. I fervently hope that in the near future, the whole earth may be stirred and shaken by the results of your achievements. The Almighty will no doubt grant you the help of his grace, will invest you with the tokens of his might, and will endue your souls with the sustaining power of his Holy Spirit. Be not concerned with the smallness of your numbers, neither be oppressed by the multitude of an unbelieving world. Exert yourselves. Your mission is unspeakably glorious. Should success crown your enterprise, America will assuredly evolve into a center from which waves of spiritual power will emanate and the throne of the kingdom of God will in the plenitude of its majesty and glory be firmly established. Very well read, Miss Marion. Thank you. It should be remembered that the carrying out of the seven-year plan involves insofar as the teaching work is concerned no more no more than the formation of at least one center in each of the central and south american republics the hundredth anniversary of the birth of the faith of baha'u'llah should witness if the plan already launched is to meet with success the laying in each of these countries of a foundation however rudimentary on which the rising generation of the American believers may, in the opening years of the second century of the Baha'i era, be able to build. Theirs will be the task in the course of successive decades to extend and reinforce those foundations and to supply the necessary guidance, assistance, and encouragement that will enable the widely scattered groups of believers in those countries to establish independent and properly constituted local assemblies and thereby erect the framework of the administrative order of their faith. The erection of such a framework is primarily the responsibility of those whom the community of the North American believers have converted to the divine message. It is a task which must involve, apart from the immediate obligation 
of enabling every group to evolve into a local assembly, the setting up of the entire machinery of the administrative order in conformity with the spiritual and administrative principles governing the life and activities of every established Baha'i community throughout the world. No departure from these cardinal and clearly enunciated principles embodied and preserved in Baha'i national and local constitutions common to all Baha'i communities can under any circumstances be tolerated. This, however, is a task that concerns those who, at a later period, must arise to further a work which, to all intents and purposes, has not yet been effectively started. Let us read this one. Miss Valerie, could you please read this one? Paragraph 91. To pave the way in a more systematic manner for the laying of the necessary foundation on which such permanent national and local institutions can be reared and securely established is a task that will very soon demand the concentrated attention of the prosecutors of the seven-year plan. No sooner has their immediate obligation in connection with the opening up of the few remaining territories in the United States and Canada been discharged then a carefully laid out plan should be conceived, aiming at the establishment of such a foundation as already stated. The provision for these vast preliminary undertakings, the scope of which must embrace the entire area occupied by the Central and South American republics, constitutes the very core and must ultimately decide the fate of the teaching campaign conducted under the seven-year plan. Upon this campaign must depend not only the effectual discharge of the solemn obligations undertaken in connection with the present plan, but also the progressive unfoldment of the subsequent stages essential to the realization of Abdul Baha's vision of the part of the American believers are to play in the worldwide propagation of their cause. All right. Dennis, could you read this one? All right. These undertakings, preliminary as they are to the strenuous and organized laborers, of which future generations of believers in the Latin countries must distinguish themselves, require in turn, without a moment's delay, on the part of the National Spiritual Assembly and of both the National Teaching and the Inter-America Committees, pain painstaking investigations preparatory to the sending of settlers and inerrant teachers, whose privilege will be to raise the call of the new day in a new continent. And we have paragraph 93. I'll read this one. I can only, in my desire to be of some service to those who are to assume such tremendous responsibilities and to suffer such self-denial, attempt to offer a few helpful suggestions, which I trust will facilitate the accomplishment of the great work to be achieved in the very near future. To this work that must constitute an historical landmark of first class importance when completed, the energies of the entire community must be resolutely consecrated. The number of Baha'i teachers, be they settlers or travelers, must be substantially increased. The material resources, to be placed at their disposal must be multiplied and efficiently administered. The literature with which they should be equipped must be vastly augmented 
the publicity that should aid them in the distribution of such literature should be extended, centrally organized, and vigorously conducted. The possibilities latent in these countries should be diligently exploited and systematically developed. The various obstacles raised by the widely varying political and social conditions obtaining in these countries should be closely surveyed and determinately surmounted. In a word, no opportunity should be neglected and no effort spared to lay as broad and solid a basis as possible for the progress and development of the greatest teaching enterprise ever launched by the American Baha'i community. Hey, Esan, I have something on the previous uh, paragraph. Yes, dear Tesfai. In 92, I think paragraph 92, that I see that uh, so both the national teaching and the inter-America communities, is it inter-America communities are, have the same administrative power with the national spiritual assemblies or the intermediary or what? what's their... It was an, a committee that was established. Uh, we saw pictures of them. It was a committee established for the purpose of for opening the countries in Southern and, uh, and Central Latin American countries. So it was a committee um, comprised of members to help the pioneering work to go forth in the Southern and Central uh, American countries. So it, it does not have um, the same um, powers as a National Spiritual Assembly. It was a committee, um, an agency in that sense. So they are elected by National Spiritual Assembly or um, they are assigned? They were, I believe they were assigned in, uh, for the, the, those uh, roles uh, in the Inter-America Committee. All right, thank you. Very good, thank you, dear. Okay, um, I think, yeah, this is our last paragraph, excellent. Okay, I'll read this last one and then we'll move ahead, excellent. The careful translation of such important Baha'i writings as are related to the history the teachings, or the administrative order of the faith, and their wide and systematic dissemination in vast quantities, and throughout as many of these republics as possible, and in languages that are most suitable and needed, would appear to be the chief and most urgent measure to be taken simultaneously with the arrival of the pioneer workers in those fields. Books, and pamphlets, writes Abdu'l-Baha in one of the tablets of the divine plan, must be either translated or composed in the languages of, those, of these countries and islands to be circulated in every part and in all directions, in countries where no objections can be raised by the civil authorities or any influential circles, this measure should be reinforced by the publication in various organs of the press of carefully worded articles and letters designed to impress upon the general public certain features of the stirring history of the faith and the range and character of its teachings. So there we are, dear friends, covering those paragraphs, paragraphs 87 through 94. As we have covered in these paragraphs, the beloved guardian describes the needs and conditions of those who are now leaving their native homes to pioneer and teach the cause in the, these virgin territories. We saw just an example of this spirit and excitement of the pioneers that went forth in the part 19. And Shore Effendi provides, now he's providing practical guidance on the teaching campaign initiated to win the goals of the first seven year plan. So he tells you that you have to have translations, you have to have your materials, you have to have, so that when you go forth, you be, can be able to effectively uh, teach the faith. So we're going to get into that in this section. So, some of the major key points that we covered in this paragraph. I'll, I'll read the first uh, part A and then 
we'll have a reader for part uh, B and C. So these are the major key points from paragraphs 87 through 94. Those who intend to pioneer should place their whole trust in God. They should teach themselves first. And they should regard the triumph of the faith as their supreme objective. They should not consider the largeness or smallness of the hearer's capacity. And they should remember that their love of Baha'u'llah will act as a storehouse of treasure for their souls. Again, it comes up, be as unrestrained as the wind. They should teach with enthusiasm, conviction, wisdom, and courtesy, but without pressing their hearer. They should teach the cause for the sake of God and remember that the faithful spirit will strengthen them. And they should keep in mind the greatness of the blessing that is waiting for them. So this is the, uh, the instructions for those who intend to pioneer. And this is the instructions for anyone who wants or should have that desire to teach the cause of God. This is the instruction. Okay. Dear Tesfai, could you read B and C for us? Okay. <clears throat> okay. B is to be the number of local spiritual assemblies was increased from 14 to 37 during the two year gap between the first and second seven year plans. See the 10 year crusade achieved the goal of forming a national spiritual assembly in each of the 20 Latin American republics. Thank you, dear Tesfa. Thank you. So, starting up, girding up the loins of endeavor. This was the first extract. We, we can go, this is Tesfa's dear question. Here we go. Oh, let some at this very moment gird up the loins of their endeavor, right? What is girding up the loins of their endeavor? So before, when the Romans, the Greeks, even the Babylonians, um, when, before they went into war, they had these type of loin cloths um, that would cover their torso even and and so what they had to do is they had to wrap them up and so they wouldn't even trip and then uh so they would uh, wrap them around their legs and around their thigh and then around their um manhood area and so it, and then tie it so then they would, it's called girding up the loins. <laughs> so that's the terminology. So they would tie it so they wouldn't trip when they ran into the uh, combat. So this is the, the, the phrase called girding up the loins. It means go forth and do it, you know, you know, and that's, it's an expression of going forth and doing it, but it also has historical context and actually is not a very uh, awesome picture. It's on YouTube. In, uh, when you do a YouTube search in the Google Photos, um, called if you put that expression "gird up the loins," you can actually see one of these Greek people doing the actual uh, wrapping up of the garment of the loins it, itself around the legs, because that is actually historically how they did it before they went into combat. Okay, that's your answer, dear Tesfaya. Hopefully that satisfies you. Thank you. Yeah, that's good, good thing. Good, good explanation. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. You're yeah, happy. So in these paragraphs, uh, we talked about this. Uh, the beloved guardian describes the needs and conditions of those that need to leave their homes, right? And so that, um, and he's go and we went through all of these qualities that the pioneers have to 
internalized. Remember, this whole book is a manual for action. And I love that, dear friends, because this is an action book. This is a book for action. How to transform the inner life, right? How to transform you to become a true Baha'i, a new race of man. Yes, of course. So he first, I, I'm going to just do a two second recap because this has been a long course and we might be forgetting things along the way, right? So at the very beginning, we started talking about the history of the early American Baha'i community, right? And then he started talking about the trials and tribulations of defections and everything. Then he started, the beloved guardian started saying that we have to have a new kind of conduct, a new kind of conduct as to set against this degenerate race that is in America. A new, because we are supposed to be this new race of men, right? And this new rectitude of conduct that the, the beloved guardian calls upon us is formulated by these seven qualities, truthfulness, honesty, reliability, right? Justice. So these are the qualities that needs to be internalized. Then he brings forth five qualities, and these are the chaste and holy life. He says this needs to be internalized. So again, seven qualities, five qualities, all need to be internalized. Then of this chaste and holy life, after that, he says, now, he says, now I want to bring the white and black together by the elimination of the freedom of racial prejudices. And he says, this should be your watchword. Right. And he says, now he says to let the white do this. And he says, let the Negro do that. Okay. Let the, the whites and let the African-Americans, let the whites and let the blacks. And he says, this is how, if they do this, then compensatory, the African-Americans will be able to embrace them lovingly because the whites are making that supreme effort. Right. So he says, this is now your focus because this is the most vital and challenging issue. Right. So he says, you got to do this. And very interestingly, I highlight this and I bring this out as important. Paragraph early on. <laughs> I can't remember every paragraph. But very early on, the beloved guardian says that when he was outlining rectitude of conduct, when he was outlining chaste and holy life, and when he was outlining freedom from racial prejudices, he said, Rectitude of conduct primarily is focused to the administrative order, to the ones that are serving on the institutions. And he said, chaste and holy life is focused primarily at our dear youth. But he said, very interestingly, this freedom from racial prejudices is for the entire body, whether young or old, whether black or white, does not matter because this is the primarily focus of the entire body of American believers, right? So this is the per se the most important and the one that we should be focusing on. So I'm just doing a very quick recap because I, we, sometimes we forget these very important points. So then we after this we went into a history on race. Then we started exploring this double crusade how it, it uh, is focused in, in uh, not only as a transformation of the inner life and external conditions of the American Baha'i community, but how it plays into the greater community, right? And it is through the transforming power of the creative word that we can really touch the hearts. And this transforming creative power of the word is, begins four letters, Begins with an L, love, love, right? And this powerful is a connection of heart to heart. And when that love permeates you and touches another heart, this is how, you know, we uh, as an African-American and as a white heart will be able to be knit together. It is love. And the greatest expression was Abdul Baha when he called forth Louis Gregory and uh, Louise Matthews and said, Mary, what a symbol of love, you know, that and love 
And through that obedience, love joined and knit them together and was an expression of love between them. And he said, this is a symbol of love towards the community. And, and at that point in that time, the meetings and assemblies and the com committees were all separate in America. And, and when Louis Gregory came there as a married couple, <laughs> they were like, what's going on, right? And then we traveled throughout the communities. He was, it was an incredible manifestation of love. You see that? So this is, I'm just trying to highlight on these. And then as we moved on, we talked, started talking about teaching. This incredible gift that Baha'u'llah has given us in Kitab Ahdas. And teaching is the expression of utterance from our mouth. So everything before was internal. Do this, internal. Do this, become this creation. Work on your inner life. Work on your character. Work on your chaste and holy life. Work on all these prejudices, right? And eradicate them. So what? What is the entire purpose that you will be this transformed creation that when you open your mouth and it comes in paragraph 75 that you have now internalized through acquisition of knowledge, you have deepened yourself in the writings, you have uh, studied the Islam, you have, so that when you open your mouth, you'll be able to teach the cause, right? So that you won't be like, yeah, I have no idea. I don't, you know, go go online. There's a website called Baha'i.org. <laughs> that you will be able to teach from you. And because remember, this faith is heart to heart. And so that you will be able to teach this cause. And it is from the love, because this is a love thing, right? The love emanates from you. The more that you love this faith, it will be translated and come across. See? Just like you might have a passion for cooking, or you might have a passion for gardening, or whatever. You can't help but talk about it, or you might can't help but express it. And this is what Baha'u'llah says. When you fall in love with something, you will want to know more about it. You will want to know everything about it. He says, fall in love with me. Fall in love with me. Fall in love with, and when he says fall in love with me, he says fall in love with the teachings, the principles, and absorb it into your heart. And then, because you're a lover, you just want to pour it out to the world. You can't help because your cup is now brimming for overflowing. And that's what Baha'u'llah is calling us to do. Because he says fall in love with me, and like a fountain, just release it to the world. Beautiful. I love it. So, so then now he starts saying, now we start understanding what is the beloved guardians doing here? He's setting up his soldiers. He's giving them all of their requirements, their, the, the necessary tools to go forth into the teaching field. They have to have that rectitude of conduct, their first weapon. You have to have the, next, the other weapon, which is the chase and holy life. And they got to have the freedom from racial prejudices. Then right after that, we get into paragraph 70s, where he's talking about now you, you got those three things. That's great. But you also got to equip yourself. First and foremost, you have to teach yourself, right? Equip yourself. Studying of all of, not only of all the laws, ordinances, and history, and Islam, which is the foundation. You have to equip yourself. But then... He goes further and says in this paragraph, in this section, we also find go further. You got to put your whole trust in God. Teach yourself first and have that love and faith, right? And that reliance on him. So that was a, a few minute recap over the first section that we've covered. I wanted to do that. So to keep it fresh, because sometimes, dear friends, we don't often recap as much as we need to. So, dear friends, before we carry on, we're at exactly 8.30. And so next time, we will get into uh, part 20 and uh, covering this aspect of girding up the loins of our endeavor. So, dear friends, any questions at this point?
Hey, your son. Yes, my dear friend. <laughs> From your highlights, that something come to my mind that uh, what is the moral and uh, behavioral standards of the guilty conscience for the Baha'is? One more time, dear Tesfaye. I didn't oh, okay. understand your question. So what is the moral and the behavioral standards for the guilty conscience? Did, uh, Dr. Bai, did you understand his question? I, I didn't follow it. I apologize. I didn't Bai. understand the last word. Guilty Conscience. what? Aruna, did you say could you, could you, moral yeah, what? I'll repeat one conscience. more time. I, I, uh, I say that is to be what is the moral and uh, behavioral standards for the Baha'is of the guilty conscience. C O N S C I E N C E. Conscience. Is that the word you say? Yeah. The guilty conscience. The guilty conscience. Yeah, conscience. Oh, conscience. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, dear Tesfai. Uh, pronunciation, you threw us off. So the, uh, the moral conscience, okay? Yeah, the moral and behavioral standards. Okay. Dr. Bight, uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, do you want to answer this one? Yeah. First of all, I had such an incredible uh, um, appreciation of the book that you summarized it in a few minutes <laughs> of various sta stages. I never heard that. So I'm very excited about that. That was wonderful. Uh, I really don't know it, Sanjan. Uh, I know as Baha'is, we have to have a very high moral standards in every sense. But guilty conscience, if you have a guilty conscience, it means uh, there is something we have done or we have witnessed or we have been part of that we know that's been wrong. So the moral standard is uh, to separate ourselves from that action, that group, or that uh, event. Mm. So our standards should be that if, for example, we say a group of people of are uh, committing atrocities against another group, it doesn't matter where in the world, we have to make sure that uh, we make it known that we are not part of it and we do all we can to stop that atrocity. If the guilty conscience is, uh, uh, let's say it's about uh, personal actions, then our moral standard is that we have to stop it. Let's say we do something personally that uh, we feel guilty about it, we should just stop it. And we should pray to be able to do that. People who are used to certain things uh, would be very hard if they're getting addicted to something. It's very hard to get away from that. So a lot of prayers and asking support from family and friends to do that. Yeah. That's really all I can say, Sanjay. Thank you very much, Dr. Bait. Um, I just have a thought on this. When you have a guilty conscience, it means you know what is correct, but you are being dishonest to your own in, in your own inner life. That's what it means. So you already know what is the correct path, but you are being dishonest. Because honesty, as you remember, is truthfulness within. Okay? And dishonest, and so that's what honesty means. Honesty means truthfulness within. Because truthfulness is in speech. But honesty is truthfulness within. But when you're being dishonest, it means you're not being truthful within yourself. So you already know that you're doing something wrong. And that's why you're feeling guilty. You feel guilty because you know you're doing something wrong. You're not being honest to yourself so you have this feeling that is not quite right 
And that uneasiness is your inner life battling itself. And so we have to conquer ourselves. And, and, and that inner struggle is the most important struggle to conquer our inner self and become the victor over our inner self. It's called, the beloved guardian calls it the insistent self because the self is always trying to dominate over us. It's the lower self. So dear friends, any so other- is it Okay, with a daily account that you pray forgiveness for this kind of uh, yes. behavior because somebody asked me like that. And then I say that maybe just give forgiveness and pray that's why I just want to ask him to get more detail. Great question, dear Tesfa. You're right. Forgiveness is all is is um, you're right, absolutely. But the beloved guardian, as we have highlighted, is prayer is one thing, but then that should turn 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 into action. You know, so. We don't just you know, sit around and say, oh, God, guide me, protect me. <laughs> but you don't actually do anything to do an aspect of protecting yourself. For example, if it's a lightning storm, you, know, you don't go sit out in the middle of a field. Oh, God, guide me, protect me. And you get struck by lightning. You, you know, it's just like, come on, people. You, don't, you have to be, use a little bit of wisdom. You know, I know this was a bit humorous, you know? <laughs> but I wanted to give you an example of the words of prayer are is calling on his assistance, but we also have to go and act like the prayer is answered. So we have to go and do the action component. And that is what the beloved guardian is calling us to do. Um, apart from that, something else I just wanted to highlight because you brought it up, dear Tesfai, is every one of these prayers, and it's very interesting, and I know I discovered this myself. You can look at the Baha'i, the, the prayer book, um, the American Baha'i prayer book, and it's about 14 or 15 prayers for forgiveness. Okay? Is it that we are so bad, truly, we are pretty bad, right? That we have to have 15 prayers from Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha and say, oh God, you know, please forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> that's 50 yes, prayers. John, that's a small small selection There's a lot more prayers about that <laughs> i <story>. know <laughs> i understand that i understand that and there's quite a lot more that's untranslated but the point of what i'm making is it's also for us to learn how to be forgiving too you know because our lord is the forgiver so Every time we read one of these prayers for forgiveness, we should also learn the qualities and attributes of being forgiving. Now think about that, dear friends. How many fights, how many quarrels, how many grudges we hold on to. But if we just learned and read and studied one of those prayers of forgiveness and followed that and learned how to let go, like our, we we're calling our Lord to let go, how much nicer the world would be. You understand? Because we're all constantly saying, oh God, forgive all of our sins, but we're constantly harping on other people's sins, right? So maybe those prayers are also, in a sense, guidance on us how to live our life. You see? Excellent. Very good thoughts. Uh, wishing you a wonderful week and enjoyed our session let's have a closing prayer and then we will, i will bid you adieu and then next week we'll pick up and finish up part 20 covering this uh girding up our loins of our endeavors and so it's been a pleasure and thank you so much each one of you um whoever would like to share a prayer please thank you create in me a pure heart oh my god and renew a tranquil conscience within me, O oh my hope. Through the spirit of thy power, confirm thou me in thy cause, O oh my best beloved. And by the light of thy glory, reveal unto me thy path, O oh thou the gold of my desire. Through the power of thy transcendent might, lift me up unto the heaven of thy holiness, O oh source of my being. 
and by the breezes of thine eternity gladden me, O thou who art my God. Let thine everlasting melodies breathe, tra breathe tranquility on me, O my companion. And let the riches of thine ancient countenance deliver me from all except thee, O my master. And let the tidings of the revelation of thine incorruptible essence bring me joy, O thou who art the most manifest of the manifest and the most hidden of the hidden. Beautiful, Miss Donna, and thank you, every one of you, and look forward to seeing you next week. And have a wonderful right. evening, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you. <clears throat>